Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MSU WMA podcast. Um, I have a special guest with me here today, uh, MSU basketball player Paul Davis and partner at Podium Risk Management. How's it going, Paul? Hey, Jacob, appreciate you, uh, appreciate you having me, and uh, as always, go green. Go white. Uh, so first we'll get started with, um, you know, your MSU career. Uh, you played at MSU from 2002 to 2005. You know, you made it to uh, two Elite Eights, one Final Four in 2005. Um, so take us back to the glory days. You know, um, Tom Izzo was, you know, starting off his career at Michigan State. Um, and tell us just a little bit about, you know, what you learned being a Spartan and how that transitioned you into the place yeah it, um, you know it's crazy 15 years ago now I left campus um, you know <clears throat> there were times my freshman year I, I didn't know how, how I was going to get through the next practice and then you snap your fingers um, and it's done and you know one thing that I I took away I think every player does is um there's always some regrets, but, you know, to be able to hang a banner in Breslin and feel good about coming to games and looking up, um, something pretty special. And, uh, you know, coach, um, I always tell the guys these days, he's toned down no matter what you think. Uh, he was at, at an 11 every single hour of every single day back then. But, um, you know, that's what it takes to build a, a program. Um, and luckily, you know, I grew up about an hour from uh, East Lansing and Rochester and, you know, coach never really recruited too far outside of Michigan or the Midwest. So we have a, a great core group of guys that, um, are still in Michigan and now entering the business world. Um, but also that we're able to get back to the university, um, often. And, uh, I think all those things are, are pretty special because you I saw a lot of value when the team's group came back to, um, you know, just help us talk to us. And, and then you, you want to give back because of uh, just the culture and something very special. And um, I, I don't think it uh, operates at that level at many programs. Yeah. So you were pretty um, heavily recruited out of high school. I saw that, you were Mr. Basketball in 2002 and then a McDonald's All-American. What other schools were uh, were looking at you and why did you decide to uh, come to Michigan State and play for Tom Izzo? The very first recruiting letter I ever got was from Liberty University. Um, and then I think probably got one from every D1 school. Um, growing up, I always wanted to go to North Carolina or Duke, um, you know, Jerry Stackhouse and Vince Carter, and um, but when it came down to it, um, my mother went to Michigan State, so I, you know, I bled green and white from the beginning. Um, but after my sophomore year in high school, which was after the year MSU won the championship, uh, coach offered me a scholarship, and you know, it's kind of like how how could you turn that down? And even though North Carolina Duke, obviously amazing programs, but um, it there were a lot of memories made with my family being able to just get in a car and drive to every game. So, um, you know, that was uh, for many reasons that, uh, that was the reason why I chose MSU, but, um, you know, coach, he's, he's all time. And, uh, what you see is what you get off the court and behind the scenes too. Um, but <clears throat> it, uh, yeah, it just it, it's something unique, you know, with our streak now, I think we're number two active streak making the tournament. Um, there is no program that has as many former players back throughout the year. Uh, so all those things, you know, it's just um, one of those decisions that you're glad that that you made. And um, what we learned there, not obviously not just the basketball, but just how to be men really quick, not from, you know, how coach coached us, but just the media, the pressures and, you know, being on 
uh, in a fishbowl right away, that prepares you more than anything for life after. Um, you know, there's nothing that will present itself that, um, you know, you, you know you can't handle or, or work through. So um, probably gain more off the court uh, through my years at MSU than I did on. What do you think makes uh, Michigan State and Tom Izzo so consistent? I think it's at 23 or 24 tournaments in a row now. And I think he has the the most Final Four appearances of any coach in the past 20 years. What do you think is so consistent about the program that year, year in and year out they're, they're playing for a Final Four national championship, a Big Ten title? You know, I think it's – obviously starts with coach um but he is not he's not changing or modifying the culture and how we do things the system to to keep up with the times you see kentucky you see duke some of the one and done schools that want to bring these top five recruits well <clears throat> you can't build a program off of that and the recruit is literally just coming there because they have to and you look at Gonzaga, uh, same thing. I mean, it's impressive what, <clears throat> what we've been able to do over the last 25 years, <clears throat> because every year that target on our back gets bigger. So we're getting everybody's best game every single day. <clears throat> but I think it starts with the culture. And then, you know, I always bring up former players are – very involved with the current team year to year, and that's special. Yeah, we see uh, Tum Tum as a, an assistant now on the team, and we see him on the court every now and then. Like, was there classes you took at Michigan State that you think benefited you um, in your role today? You know, it's a great university, but I'd be lying if I didn't learn more on the court and in the games and practice. Um, I did see and talk with I think one or two years, a sports psychologist who was a professor at MSU. And, um, I, you know, he worked with, I think with Julius Irving way back when. And, um, and I, I work with a performance coach now, Ben Newman, who was also a former Spartan. Um, I think it's not, <clears throat> It's not necessarily the information that you have or can learn because luckily now we can literally learn anything at any time at any day. But how are you, what angle are you looking at something or approaching? Because um, just the way or reframing how we think or our energy or how we look at it uh, makes all, all the difference in the world. And so <clears throat> I think the best advice or mentors I've gotten and still continue to get is, hey, I have this thing. Well, what if you look at it this way? Or this year in goal feels huge. Well, let's break it down week by week. And I think just reframing how we look or our energy uh, at a certain situation, uh, I think that's the biggest <clears throat> Biggest take takeaway I've gotten from uh, you know my time there and after Michigan State is just how you look at a problem or adversity um, because they're they're going to come and making sure that you don't shy away from it, um, which I think a lot of people do. But that's the only way that we're going to grow is just going through some stuff. Um, favorite quote. <clears throat> everything we want or who we want to be is on the other side of fear. And again, you could, uh, you can use that for any industry, any stage of life. Yeah. That's interesting. You bring up uh, psychology because uh, Michigan state's actually bringing a psychology course to the CFP program. So I believe they're offering it uh, next year, but it's in the works. Um, so transitioning great. more into um, basketball again, the transfer portal, it's been very popular as of late. Michigan State has lost three three players this season to the transfer portal, and we've gotten one in return. Uh, why do you think there's been such a drastic transition in players 
wanting to move to different teams? Again, which goes back to that Amazon culture. Um, I personally think the transfer portal is going to diminish programs. It's going to give players the wrong mindset. And it's, it's, it's going to have an effect on their time after their sport because I don't care if you transfer and you go pro, you're going to be done at some point and you're going to be a normal citizen much, much longer than we were ever athletes. Um, $10 million seems like a lot, but $10 million, uh, you can spend that pretty quick. You know, I don't think players realize um, the amount of time left in their lives. And with doctors and medicine, I mean, when we get into our, uh, you know, 70s and 80s, people could be living past 100 on average. Um, so <clears throat> if you're recruited by a school, I mean, they put a lot of time to bring you there. And if you are doing what you need to do, being successful, there's no coach that's going to put you on a bench. Um, but again, going back to adversity, some guys hit adversity and then, okay, I just, I want to go somewhere else and think that everything is going to be better. Well, what happens when that adversity comes again? What happens when that adversity comes after your sport? Um, the exposure, the tutelage, the just your, the growth that you can get from being a star player at Michigan State or a walk-on is so much more valuable than averaging 20 points at a mid, mid D1 team. Um, like I said, I think all of us got more from coach and the university of just how to handle everything off the court than we ever did on the court. Um, I mean, look at, you know, Magic Johnson, <clears throat> Steve Smith, uh, you know, Matt Ishbia, Matt was a walk-on. If he wanted to play, he could have transferred. But, I mean, from his family to the lessons he learned from coach, um, it created him into a multi-billionaire. And he's made more money now in business than any of those guys combined. So, I just think it sends the wrong message and it's going to hurt the programs. But again, adversity comes. This is like a get out of jail free card, uh, which I think at some point it's just going to have an effect in the wrong way on these, these players. Yeah. That's why I think Michigan state's been so successful. You know, they do, they do tend to have a lot of four year players that develop over the years and a lot of the one and done programs like Duke, North Carolina, they're kind of falling off nowadays than they did before because you have the option of going to the G League now instead of going to one of those programs. Because I know uh, one of the recruits, Amani Bates, he's still undecided if he would want to go to Michigan State or the G League. And I think that's something that Tom Izzo, you know, represents is building that brotherhood and a culture where you can develop under a great coaching staff that will prepare you for the future. You, you brought up great names like Magic Johnson, Steve Smith, like those, those guys are, you know, multimillionaire, multi-billionaires. So, I mean, that just goes to show that just cause you know, you fall, you don't just leave, you know, you get back up and that's what makes you stronger. So yeah. I think, I think we'll, we'll see these four year programs come back like they, they once did. Uh, I think it just, it, it'll take a little bit of time um, just because the G League now offers that that option. Yeah, the, the worst thing that G League could do is pay those guys more money. When I was, when I was in the NBA, the highest contract was 24,000 for the entire year. So if guys went to the D League, they're trying to get out. Now, guys would just hang out there and make a hundred, hundred K. I mean, that it's going to put those guys at such a disadvantage. I'm seeing it. I'm, you know, 
tonight I'm talking on a, a panel with the NBA Players Association about that transition. Um, the goal is to make more money after your playing days than during your playing days. And you can't do that by shying away from some tough uh, obstacles. And again, I just, I think the coaches like Tom Izzo, they're, they're not going to be around that much longer because the, uh, just the world is changing. The media, the parents, social media. Um, I don't think it's the kids that are changing. I think it's the tutelage and what's not, uh, what we're not holding them accountable to anymore. Um, so I, I'm, I'm nervous. I mean, throw in like paying players and I mean that, I'm nervous what college sports are going to be like in 10 years. And I, I just I have a feeling it's going to move on to high school next. I mean, it's just going to get crazier and crazier because at the end of the day, there's a lot of money in all these things. And, you know, if you can get a two year old, a Nike deal and they're going to become the next Jordan, you know, Shoe companies are going to do whatever they can to get those players, and it's just going to be younger and younger. But again, it's just going to <clears throat> put put uh, athletes in a terrible spot when their playing days are done. They're not going to have that skill or that understanding of how do you how do I now create the rest of my life for seventy years? Where, where's my purpose without a screaming crowd? Um, so. Scary, scary stuff, but, you know, I hope, uh, you know, it's almost just we need some common sense and we need somebody to call out. Even though it might help them now, it's not going to help them in the future. Yeah, we actually see that with a lot of professional athletes. You know, they don't really know how to manage their money once they get into the league. And there's a great example of um, a hockey player uh, that played for the San Jose Sharks. Um, he was like, 27 million dollars in debt but he was also making like 10 million dollars a year but it was due to like a very poor gambling issue seeing that with um one of mark cuban's players he played for the dallas he played for dallas it was west something west but then he, he was like living on the streets you know after his career so what do you think um athletes need to learn in college to you know, really manage their money once they get, you know, out of college into the pros or into a career? Yeah, I mean, that's why I love what Michigan State and what you guys are doing, because I know you're, they're really trying to build out the wealth management school. And, um, you know, Econ 101 is not teaching you about personal finance. I mean, we need to go into high schools. You know, right now it's when people start making a lot of money, oh, let's, you know, let's show you how quick a million dollars can go. And um, I mean, it needs to start day one on campus because athlete, student athletes, uh, you know, we got scholarship check. Um, mine was like 800 bucks a month. You know, I grew up in Rochester. I didn't have to worry about where my next meal was, but some of the kids from Flint, Detroit, if they get, you know, thousand bucks a month, putting that money into some type of investment or and starting a plan that can change their families' lives over time. And it's those habits, it's the routine, you know, um, it's, it's not the athletes don't know how to manage their money. All 99% of advisors are great. It's just athletes get into that habit of you can go spend and do whatever you want or accumulate a couple of houses, this and that, because you know another check's coming. Well, those are very difficult habits to get out of when you're done playing. And again, decades and decades and decades. And if you don't find your next passion or your next thing, uh, I was retired at 32 and at the nine month mark, I was bored. Um, where do you find that adrenaline rush? A lot of guys go start doing gambling. And when you're bored, you spend money. And uh, I mean, Antoine Walker, one of the nicest guys in the world, 
blew $110 million. It can, it can be done, um, but it's just those habits and it's getting to the guys early to help them see what is possible and help them understand uh, how, how long they're gonna be around. Um, Cause we all feel like Superman. We've never lived a day in our life without that sport. Um, and it's a very weird feeling when you don't have it anymore and you don't feel you have the skills to create your next, next thing. Um, so I think that's where <clears throat> former players have to be the ones telling current players. It can't be, you know, somebody from, um, you know, a great financial institution, but they've never sat in those chairs. It has to be guys like myself, <clears throat> guys that have played there. Like, listen, this is coming and I know exactly what you guys are going through, about to go through. Um, and it's creating that opportunity for those stories and that mentorship. Um, because again, those habits are just, they're hard to break. And especially if you don't have another passion or a purpose, it's just going to speed that process up. So um, just to wrap up this conversation, how do you think MSU is going to fare next year in uh, football and basketball? Well, if, you know, I was talking to somebody at the Spartan Fund yesterday, and I didn't know if we're going to need to suit up, if we're going to have enough guys on the court. Um, you know, this past year was a weird year. I, I couldn't imagine being a student athlete. Um, so I think the uh, the pent up passion, anger, uh, excitement. I think that's going to come out <clears throat> next year. Now, probably going to come out for every team, um, but for basketball, I mean, next year could be. I think coaches. That's going to be his year to win his second championship, which has always been a goal. Um, Coach is not going to make a layup. None of us are. I mean, the opportunity that those guys will have is um, probably almost more special than any team before them. Um, coaches wanted that second championship, and everybody in the world has been waiting for that. So I think the basketball team, uh, if those, those guys realize the – uh, the year that they can have and what, uh, how special that could be when looking back in history. Um, I think they're going to, they're going to make a run, whatever a run is. Um, and I think for the football team, I mean, we won games that we probably didn't think we were going to and then lost games. So, Hey, there's something there. And I think as long as they have an identity and they, they know they can beat and play with anybody. Again, it's just the mindset and how you look at it. If, if you feel that you belong and you deserve to have this exposure, um, that's going to come out on the court. But if, if <clears throat> again, if you think that you're going to beat a team by just walking on the court or the field, um, again, MSU has built their brand up. We're going to get everybody's best game. Um, so I think the city, the community, the coaches, it's just going to be, hey, do the players want to leave their own legacy or do they want to get through the year to get to whatever's coming next? So, um, yeah, I, I think we'll have great years. Now, whatever those mean, uh, I don't know, but um, you know, Coach Izzo's not going to be around for that much longer, and so I hope hope these next couple of years can be pretty special. Yeah, I definitely want to win one more before I, uh, I graduate from here, and I think definitely next year's our year. Uh, we saw Coach Fife went over back to Indiana this this off season, and um, I saw Denzel Valentine's older brother also got the head coaching position at Loyola. Um, so you, you said, you know, Tom, he probably has, uh, you know, five, 10 years left in, in this program. And then 
where do you think uh, where do you think the reins will be passed on to? Do you think Dwayne Stevens could possibly get it, or you know, do you think um, Valentine will come back to Michigan State? Yeah, I uh, I like your optimism. I don't think Coach has five or ten years. Um, now I don't know this, I, I, but I see him having a senior night with Steven. Um, you know, this year you may have a special group of guys, and then. Uh, the following year when, you know, his son is a senior, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like for coach just to enjoy every practice, every game, and then pretty cool way to go out. Um, senior night with your son. Um, <clears throat> so who, who knows? You, you, you never know, but uh, that's kind of in my mind. And I've always said, you know, Brian Gregory uh, was assistant that recruited me. Um, I've always thought that Brian Gregory would be the right uh, replacement for, for coach. Um, you know, Dwayne Stevens came in when I was there. I mean, him and Fife, I've gotten to see behind the scenes uh, absolute brilliant minds and coaches. I mean, the top in the country. Once you step into that head coaching job, now it's a business. Now there's, it's almost, there's more outside of basketball that you have to deal with um, than basketball. And there's not a lot of people that have those personalities or understand and that it's an average single day job times 10. Um, so that'd be my, my thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a Tom Crean fan too, but Brian Gregory would be my, my first choice. You know, it's got to be somebody who's come up through that program. Um, they're going to be, you know, big shoes to fill. But, again, you just you still have the support of the former players, the community, the fans, and uh, time to start a, a new legacy. I agree. Uh, well, Paul, thank you. It was a great conversation, Paul. Thank you so much for uh, coming on. If you liked what you just heard, please like, comment, and share. MSU WMA or Michigan State University Wealth Management Association is a student organization part of the Eli Broad College of Business located in East Lansing, Michigan. Our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation of financial planners. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please check out our channel on all platforms such as Spotify and Apple Podcast. And check out our social media at MSUWMA and MSUWMA.com.